So what what is what are those other concerns? Well, f- principally for 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 Lakatos, it's how well a program deals with the anomalies as they build up. If anomalies are inevitable, if they are the thing which ultimately might lead to the downfall of a research program or or paradigm or a theory or whatever, uh, then the, the the fundamental skill that a, a, a scientist has to have in working with a research program is to be able to deal with these anomalies in a way that is constructive or productive. Sometimes anomalies can actually push a research program to become better. You know, they rise to the challenge, as it were. Uh, They grow, they develop, they overcome obstacles, and they become a more powerful research program as a result. Or alternatively, these uh, anomalies, these objections, can cause a theory to stagnate, a research program to stagnate and to flail. And, you know, it, it might make changes to the protective belt, but it does it in a way that sort of feels fundamentally intellectually dishonest. It feels like it's trying to avoid problems rather than to honestly deal with them. It's trying to save its own ass rather than understand the world as it, as it really is. So uh, his terminology for this, I think, is, is, is fairly memorable. It's worth noting. A research program is progressive, Lakatos says, when it accommodates this anomalous data, while at the same time increasing its predictive power or its puzzle-solving power. So an anomaly crops up, um, the, and the, 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 theory, the theorists working in this, this idea buckle down, they think about it, and they come up with a solution which not only sort of dispels the, under, the fundamental anomalous data, but also also shows why the anomaly showed up in the first place, and, uh, and and it gives us a new set of tools that we can then use to to extend the underlying research program even further. Uh, it, it grows stronger from the opposition. By contrast, a research program is degenerating when it can patch up these anomalies, when it can accommodate the new data, which again, you know, is, is not necessarily a difficult thing to do in the face of, of, of anomalies. But it does that in ways that prevents it from creating novel predictions. It does not increase its puzzle-solving power. Um, you know, it, it, it explains away the data, but then it leaves us with no place else to go with, regarding what happens the next time a new anomaly shows up, or, 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 or it does not do a good job of explaining why the anomaly showed up. Um, this, these two sort of moves of progressing or degenerating uh, uh, can appear many different times in the life cycle of a research program. It's not all going to be in one direction. It might progress for several years, degenerate for a few years as an, uh, difficult anomalies uh, pile up, but then go back to progressing after sort of new ways of solving the anomalous data come along. Um, and sort of the, so the, the, the life cycle of a research program can be charted in terms of how progressive uh, versus how degenerating it is over time. And and ideally, of course, you, know, you want the progressive uh, to outweigh the degeneration, and that suggests it, it's growing stronger, whereas if it continues to degenerate, eventually uh, the protect, protective belt might wear down and the hardcore might end up being falsified and the entire program might have to be thrown out. An illustration might help here of a, of a progressive versus degenerating research program. So an excellent example of a progressive research program in the history of science, Lakatos thinks, is Newtonian mechanics in the 18th century. Um, now, uh, the, the way sort of Newton initially sort of outlined his celestial mechanics, for example, was a, 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 a known oversimplification. And he, there's a lot of noise, a lot of complication. So uh, you, know, you can, for example, uh, do new, basic Newtonian astronomy by treating all the planets as point masses. Uh, that's, again, Newton is aware that's an oversimplification, that they're not literally point masses, but it allows us to, 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 to set aside all kinds of complications and make some, some fairly rudimentary, fairly basic, but reasonably accurate predictions and calculations about the place of, pl- of the planets with respect to each other. But of course, that kind of oversimplification can only last for so long. And as we move on sort of past Newton's own lifetime and into the 18th century, uh, and then of course later on the 19th century, uh, the, the, the sorts of anomalies uh, that, that arise w- as a result of dealing with planets and stars as point masses start to become problematic. And so new research is done. And that uh, uh, gives us sort of new models and new ways of uh, uh, new mathematical tools for dealing with the complexities which Newton had deliberately set aside. You can start dealing uh, uh, more with you know, uneven distribution of mass throughout a body, for example. Um, and then once you have those new tools in place, new kinds of questions arose for, 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 for astronomers working in the Newtonian uh, research program. 
So it, 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 was the, it was the people within the research program itself that recognized their own limitations. They recognized the anomalies. They recognized the oversimplifications and the problems that they had. And it, 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 they weren't interested in just sort of sweeping these things aside or, or ignoring them or just f coming up with some sort of intellectually dishonest ad hoc way of explaining these problems away. Uh, it, it became more robust. And, it, and, and in that process, it made novel predictions about the future. And then those, no, those new predictions could be tested against the real world, and that is an excellent example of a progressive research program. Contrast that with Marxism in the 20th century. That is a, probably a fairly standard canonical example of a degenerating research program. Now again, when, when Marx was writing in the 19th century, he made several predictions about the coming communist revolution. So uh, most notably for our purposes here, he predicted that the communist revolution would start in industrialized countries. He was thinking in particular again, about England, where he spent much of his life, possibly the United States, uh, you know, uh, maybe Germany, where he was born and raised. That was what he imagined, where he imagined communism getting its initial foothold. Now, after he was dead, the first real foothold for, 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 for a Marxist regime in the world happened in Russia, which at the time was a largely agrarian society. They very quickly industrialized, of course, and that's what Stalin did, and that's led to a lot, a lot of uh, uh, economic advancement, but also a lot of suffering and death in the process. Uh, but you know, Marxist theorists who were alive at the time when the Russian Revolution happened uh, were somewhat surprised because this defied Marx's uh, initial prediction. Now, Marxism can uh, survive this uh, 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 this failure of fit of the data. It's not like this is a pure falsification of Marxism in the Popperian sense. Um, but by simply making sure that the you know, that, that 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 particular part of Marxist thinking that the idea that uh, um, uh, the revolution will happen in an industrialized country was part of the protective belt. It was. It, it's not part of the core of Marxist thought. And that's, again, that's not just an ad hoc move. Anyone who knows anything about Marxist thought knows that, again, the, the, the core principles are things like class consciousness and so forth. That's what's really at the core, uh, or you know, historical materialism is another core Marxist notion. Uh, the idea that the revolution is going to happen in an industrialized country is not a part of the core. So it's not a fundamental flaw that Marx got this wrong. But notice what happens once Marxists adjust to this new reality. They throw out the idea that the revolution is going to happen in an industrialized country. But what happens next? What new predictions can be made? Should we predict that the next Marxist revolution after Russia is going to then take place in another agrarian country? Or should we predict it's going to take place in an industrialized country? Does, does our modified theory now empower us to make new predictions that we couldn't make before? No. Uh, it, it doesn't put us in a position. It, it, it leaves us in a question where the, sort of the future is starting to look much more open-ended. Uh, we, we aren't able to make predictions. We don't have a, a sort of a clear next step to pursue in our research program after we make this uh, this adjustment. So. Marxism then, uh, again, this is but one example of the many ways in which Marxism was a degenerating research program, um, uh, but hopefully, uh, again, it sort of drives the point home. When, when, when anomalous data shows up and you make changes to the protective belt to fit that data, but you do it in a way that sort of leaves you unclear on where to go next, uh, uh, that is uh, something which is an undesirable position for a research program to be in, and that's why it's degenerating. Now, uh, we can use this way of thinking about the, the history of science to, to show how Lakatos solves the problem of demarcation. Remember, this is one of the big questions that Karl Popper was interested in. How do we distinguish real science from pseudoscience? Um, uh, for, for Popper, it was fundamentally about falsifiability. Lakatos is you know, you know, he's somewhat a fan of Popper, but he thinks that, the, uh, the, uh, that Popper's original thinking is just a little bit too naive. Uh, the, the fundamental difference between uh, pseudoscience and real science uh, for Lakatos can be distinguished between the, these pro progressive versus degenerating research programs. A research program might start out as a very progressive research program, very scientific. Think again about the early days of alchemy, which is which is sort of often cast as pseudoscientific through and through, um, but it really had at least some core scientific virtues and values going on in it. But after a while, of course, alchemy started to get replaced by another research program called chemistry, which adopted many of the, the virtues of the alchem alchemical program, but also managed to, to avoid a lot of the problems. So the, 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 when a, a research program 
program degenerates or stagnates long enough, it devolves into pseudoscience. And at that point, uh, you know, it, it, people should start abandoning ship. They should start rejecting those. If a program continues to degenerate and degenerate, it, it can't make new predictions. It can't give us uh, n new tools, new ways of, of, of doing research. People are sort of stuck to it for inertia or for the, because of ego or because of uh, uh, financial or career investment or something like that. That's, that's no longer science. So the fundamental difference here uh, uh, between science and pseudoscience, again, it, it isn't something that you can sort of just tell just by looking at the theory. You have to take a historical perspective on the program, take a look at how it's developed over time, and that's how you tell whether something's scientific or pseudoscientific. Now, all of the things being equal, of course, a progressive research program is, is going to be rationally preferable to a degenerating research program. But again, this is partially where, where Lakato starts to hedge a little bit. He, he's not trying to suggest here that, that we should follow sort of this as a, as, a, as a method automatically. Just because one program is progressing and another program is degenerating doesn't necessarily mean we, should, we want to automatically just abandon ship from the degenerating re research program and, and go over to the progressive one. Um, it's entirely possible that the de current a research program which is currently degenerating might recover, but it's only going to do that if people stick to it, if people try to, to, to defend it, if people try to sort of come up with ways you know, of, of dealing with the various anomalies that are starting to uh, uh, to, to build up here. Uh, and of course, there are many examples in the history of science that you can point to where a generally successful research program degenerated for a short period of time, became uh, unpopular, uh, and then had a resurgence. Uh, if you want a research example in, in, in artificial intelligence research, uh, uh, the notion of neural nets was really popular in the 1980s, fell out of fashion in the 90s, and now it's kind of back again. It's kind of uh, back in vogue. It's a, 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 a uh, updated, advanced, modified version of neural nets are, are starting to become really important in artificial intelligence research. Um, so there's, there, there's, there's sort of no way to tell for sure at any sort of given moment what the right particular thing to do is. But historically speaking, when you look at the big picture, uh, 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 you can sort of tell whether a program is headed in the right direction or not. Now, I've, sort of, I've been suggesting for these last couple of slides uh, uh, something that which is, for many people, a problem with Lakatosh's thinking, but which, which Lakatosh has no problem with at all. He actually act actively embraces. And it's the idea that these kinds of judgments about a research program, whether it is progressive or whether it's degenerating, is something which can only be made from a historical point of view. You cannot say in a particular instant whether or not an active program is progressive or whether it's degenerating, whether it's science or whether it's pseudoscience. Uh, um, you know, so if you take, for example, again, the, the, the debate over string theory versus uh, some of the other competitors like M theory or brain theory, we might want tools that can help us tell where should we be investing our scientific research in this program or in that program. Lakatosh is explicitly saying here he cannot give you advice on that. He cannot tell you uh, right now, today. He can't tell the scientist going into to the lab tomorrow. Uh, he, he's not giving them any advice for how to structure their investigations. Because Lakatosh isn't trying to give practical advice to working scientists. Uh, uh, he, he, he doesn't think that you can sort of determine what good science is from, from the kind of perspective that he's looking at. Uh, good science, that is to say, in, in, from, uh, from from what a lab does on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, he can't tell you whether or not you should abandon your currently degenerating research program or not. Obviously, you know, the more degenerating it is, the more likely it is that that's going to be the right move. Um, but he's not trying to give any sort of methodological solutions to these kinds of problems. Uh, Lakatos's phrase here is memorable. He says he's against instant rationality. Remember, he's taking the historical perspective here. Uh, 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 his tools are about how we, how we judge the history of science, uh, about the kinds of work that historians and philosophers of science are doing. It's not fundamentally about the day to day work of scientists. That's something that we can only evaluate in retrospect, hindsight being 2020 and all that. Now, uh, uh, several critics are going to jump on Lakatosh for this. I mean, again, imagine you have uh, you know a scientific lab that's working on a, 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 a program which appears to be degenerating. You know, anomalies are piling up. They don't know what to do about them. They've been trying to sort of side uh, uh, put them, brush them off to the side, sweep them under the rug, uh, but they're just getting more and more problematic. Uh, suppose we're trying to figure out whether or not we should jump ship to a different program, whether we should, we should abandon what we're doing and move on, or whether or not we should stick it out and try to soldier down, buckle down, and solve these hard problems. 
Okay? Lakato is very clearly not giving any kind of rule or any kind of method. So for, for all his talk about the importance of scientific methods and, 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 and for sort of rule-based rationality in science, this is something where, again, it seems like this is what we want scientific methodology to do, to tell us what to do in these kinds of, to use Kuhn's term, a, a crisis period. We're going we're, we're gonna to want that kind of guidance. Um, but but Lakatos actually kind of has to sort of concede the point to, uh, to Kuhn here. In the same way that Kuhn says, you know, when you're trying to decide between paradigms and crisis science, it's a judgment call. Again, it's more like converting from one political party to another. It's not determined strictly by reason. Lakatos sort of has to concede. He doesn't. He does this very reluctantly. He doesn't want to concede this point to Kuhn, I don't think. Um, uh, but again, because of the, the power of the historical perspective, there's no real way uh, to do that. Uh, so, so in, in the midst of a crisis, uh, reason is not going to be able to settle our disputes. Now, Paul Feyerabend later on is going to pounce on Lakatos for this. Uh, uh, as far as Feyerabend is concerned, if Lakatos can't solve this problem, then what's the point of having a rational method at all? I mean, if what we want out of a philosophy of science is some kind of reason-based method, some sort of rational set of tools for governing scientific practice, uh, Lakatos doesn't appear to have given us that. What he's given is historians and philosophers of science a set of tools and a set of principles that they can use to have evaluate uh, the, the sort of historical status of various different research programs. But that's a very different kind of set of methods than what it is that presumably scientists would like from philosophers or scientists, which is to say, again, again this sort of structure, method, rule-based rationality that allows them to, to, to overcome the kinds of problems that they encounter in the lab every day. Now, again, Lakatos isn't, isn't going to take this line down, of course. He does is going to want to say that, look, we have at least some pretty general rules of thumb here we can roll by. Lakatos, again, has no problem saying that a degenerating research program is high risk. If you're part of a degenerating research program, you got to think very, very carefully about uh, uh, where your priorities lie. Because if you keep sticking to that research program as it continues to degenerate, it might take you and your career down with it. Um, it might be a way of, it might be wise to abandon abandon ship early on rather than try to stick it out and, and save it uh, uh, just because it's a way of hedging your bets. Uh, but strictly speaking, Lakatos does have to admit to Feyerabend and, and to Kuhn that there, there really is no sort of hard and fast guidance about how much risk is too much risk. It's kind of like in any sort of gamble that you take in the world. There's going to be certain sort of general ideas about uh, uh, when you're, you're betting more than you can afford, but there's also going to be some situations where it's not clear, where some sort of simple straight up mathematical analysis isn't going to tell you whether or not this is a smart bet or a, a poor bet. Now, this is somewhat complicated by the, the way that Lakatos renders, again, the relationship between philosophy of science and histor historian of science. Um, uh, the, the, the book that I uh, uh, make reference to that sort of is guiding a lot of these lectures, Theory and Reality by Peter Godfrey Smith, um, this is something he doesn't really focus on too much. So I want to say a little bit about uh, this aspect of Lakatos' thinking because I think it's important to expand on. 